Welcome, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about how to keep calm and contain a D on. My name is Anusha Raghunathan, and I'm a principal software engineer at Intuit. Intuit is a fintech company that makes software around tax preparation, uh, accounting, consumer credit reports, and stuff. So if you've ever used TurboTax, Mint, Credit Karma, or QuickBooks, then that's us. The agenda for today is basically starting off with why, why are we even doing this talk? What is the background? What are CRIs? Then we'll do a section on how we went ahead planning the migration to this new CRI. What happened during our great migration? and some performance analysis that we did with the new CRI, and finally finish it off with takeaways. Before we get started, I want to give a quick inter introdu introduction about our Kubernetes-based infrastructure. We run about 220 plus clusters, and um, they average about 16,000 nodes, and this number of nodes actually goes up pretty high during our tax peak seasons. And a number of Kubernetes namespaces, roughly about 15,000 and odd. Um, we run about 2,000 production services on this Kubernetes-based infrastructure, serving about 5,000 developers. And we have about 17,000 assets that we manage with this. And each Kubernetes cluster runs about 25 add-ons on top of the vanilla Kubernetes cluster we get. These are primarily around security and compliance, cluster lifecycle management. I want to um, call out our Keiko Proj, which is an Intuit uh, started open source project that manages our cluster add-ons, instance management, upgrade management, and stuff. Then we uh, have add-ons around observability, metrics, tracing, and logging, networking, CNI, and service mesh, uh, storage, um, reliability testing around chaos experiments, and finally, con container native uh, workflow engines, specifically Argo workflows. Now, what's a CRI? A CRI is a container runtime interface. And Kubernetes has interfaces for uh, running your storage and running your network, container networking using CNI and CSI. Similar to that, for running a container and doing some image management, there is a CRI interface that the kubelet calls out to. And a high-level container runtime, like Docker Shim or Container D, manages uh, containers and images, lifecycle of them, and in, in, in turn calls out to a low-level container runtime, such as Run C. And a CRI is a well-established uh, interface that the kubelet calls over, um, and it's gRPC-based. And um, examples of container runtimes, like I mentioned, Docker Shim, Cryo, and Container D. Now, why is it that we're talking about Container D and CRI and stuff at this point in time? Typically, your average Kubernetes operator doesn't have to worry about these things. However, now we have to worry about it because of something that happened in Kubernetes 120, which is the primary container runtime that was used in Kubernetes, which was Docker Shim, got deprecated. And Docker, just a little bit of history, Docker Daemon was the primary runtime for uh, Kubernetes, um, but it was not CRI compliant, mainly because Docker Daemon was written way before Kubernetes originated. So a thin Shim layer was written on top of Docker Daemon to make it CRI compliant. A problem was the shim struggled to find maintainership, and also there were rising container runtimes that were CRI compliant. So in Kubernetes 120, Docker shim was deprecated as the default uh, CRI. And in to Kubernetes upstream 124, it's going to be removed. That's why we all have to worry about the CRI runtimes now. So, we decided to pick Container D as our CRI runtime. Uh, why? Because Docker Daemon eventually calls Container D anyway today, even when it's not the, shim, it's not the CRI. And it's been battle tested really well. 
and it offers better performance in terms of uh, CPU memory consumption as well as pod startup times. And it's supported by our cloud provider, so we went with it. It was an easy choice. Uh, this is a quick uh, comparison about the container runtime invocation between Docker Shim and Container D. You will notice that in Docker Shim, we have the extra hops between Doc Kubelet um, uh, uh, and Docker Shim and eventually the, uh, reading up to Container D. On the right side, you will notice that the Kubelet directly calls Container D and the extra hops are eliminated. So how did we go about planning our migration? First, you need to understand the CRI wiring in your cluster. Look at your worker nodes and see how many places you have Docker uh, daemon, Docker shim sockets being exposed to all of your cluster components. In our, play, in our case, the blue Docker whale in the middle is actually the heart of a lot of things. And it was exposing Docker shim and Docker, uh, uh, Docker shim socket as well as Docker daemon socket. And um, if you look at the bottom of this diagram, there is a box with all our add-ons that we're actually relying on a CRI socket. Um, namely, the CNI, um, Chaos Engineering Toolkits, Falco add-on, which we use for security scanning for our uh, container runtime images, as well as Argo Workflow Controller. The other obvious clients of Docker uh, Daemon were the Kubelet, uh, making the client connection through the gRPC, as well as Docker CLI and API. The settings on the left side um, were mainly around Docker daemon configuration. And um, as you might see, there is a kind of SC Linux policies that we were writing based on Docker daemon, uh, GPU configurations for our ML workloads, as well as uh, container log management. And Another indirect uh, dependency that we had was that we were expecting the container logs to be in JSON format, which was offered by Docker Daemon, and uh, we were using Fluentd to ship them out. So we had to rewire our worker nodes to use uh, Containerd or other mechanisms when we had to migrate. Here is uh, how we rewired Containerd. So we mainly baked the Containerd client, which was the CryCuddle client, which worked out well for us. And uh, the CryCuddle client would talk to the uh, Containerd socket, and um, the Containerd socket was also used to communicate with our add-ons in the bottom. So the CNI, Chaos, um, uh, Falco plugins all ended up working really well with our um, new Containerd. Um, situation. And uh, notice that the Containerd config file now actually still continues to take GPU config and SC Linux, but the container log management has now moved to the kubelet. So it's no longer maintained in Containerd. You just have to configure your kubelet um, accordingly. Also notice that our Argo workflow controller is not dependent on Containerd socket anymore. Um, Argo workflow controller had a dependency on Docker, uh, mainly because uh, it needed a primitive to share the container namespaces. Two containers needed to have a, a, the same process uh, namespace. And we were now able to use the kubelet because kubelet provides process namespace sharing. So our dependency on the container runtime uh, was removed, and now we had a dependency on kubelet. And uh, finally, the indirect dependency I was talking about as far as the JSON log format was um, that Containerd doesn't have a concept of logging plugins, and it was only logging container logs in text format. And we'll see what happens because of that in a bit. A word about uh, container uh, D client cry crycuddle. We baked it basically, we baked this uh, client basically into all of our worker nodes. Um, and for the most part, we were able to actually find parity with the Docker API CLI. Main handy commands that we would use are crycuddle ps, crycuddle images. Uh, instead of Docker inspect, if you were um, used to using Docker inspect, you could do the same thing with crycuddle get info, which was used in our use case primarily to work around uh, SE Linux policies. 
So you can actually explore more on CryCuttle um, as your CRI uh, container D client. Um, we couldn't find exact parity for some of the uh, use cases. Uh, one thing I would like to call out is the Docker system prune command that we were used to for actually cleaning up leaky containers. Um, again, since Docker was more than just a CRI, it did a lot more than just container and image management. Um, so system prune, we had to find uh, like some hacky bash scripting and cron jobs on top of CryCuttle, and we were able to get it done. So the big takeaway is get familiar with some cry, uh, container D client and, uh, so that it's helpful during your migration. Um, another container D client, the obvious one, is Kublet. And um, the one thing that was um, handy, again, for us during our migration is that Kublet actually can be configured to have a different CRI. Uh, in this case, the options are container runtime and container runtime um, the socket where you could actually spin up a test cluster today uh, by setting these options and you will get a container D uh, cluster. So it's easy to just basically jumpstart on it and see where, which part of your bootstrap code you need to be changing in order to actually perform your migration. And like I mentioned earlier, now log management has moved from the CRI to Kublet, so uh, you can get familiar with the log rotation options for max size as well as max uh, files. All right. So we planned our uh, migration. We made all the code changes that were required in our cluster bootstrapper. We had reconfigured things to um, use the container D configuration rather than Docker. And all our add-ons, um, that code was also changed to uh, accommodate for container D. A lot of our end user teams and our platform teams had also migrated their code path. So one thing I would like to mention here is that at Intuit, we um, go through monthly cluster upgrade cycles, mainly for security and compliance reasons, as well as a time to actually introduce new features to our Kubernetes platform. And this is the time when we actually migrated from Docker D to Container D. And one thing to note that is that we perform rolling upgrades of our clusters. Uh, which means that you started out with Docker as your CRI for your cluster, and then you ended up with container D as CRI, but then there is a period of time during the cluster upgrade where you have a mix of both, both kinds of nodes in your cluster. And we guarantee to our end user developers that there will be zero downtime during the upgrade. So we planned and planned and we did the right things, uh, any guesses on whether it went uh, smooth or did we have any gotchas? Well, of course we had gotchas. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, two of them today. First was about the logging pipeline. Now, before we get into the details of the problem and how we solve for it, um, a quick refresher on our logging pipeline. We use FluentD as our node uh, driver for logging. And uh, FluentD is uh, responsible for uh, log collection, log parsing if it's needed, as well as shipping it to our uh, log aggregator, which is Splunk. And um, FluentD takes care of shipping pretty much all the logs uh, in our nodes, but the critical ones are container logs, and we cannot afford to miss even a small gap of logs. So log loss was not, uh, is a big no-no in our infrastructure. And FluentD runs as a daemon set and it's a cluster add-on. So what is the first problem? Well, uh, our entire logging pipeline had the assumption of JSON formatted container logs. And containerd basically broke that assumption. Uh, right from container logs to FluentD to, uh, to how it reaches our um, uh, Splunk servers, everything was expected to be in JSON format. And this was because uh, JSON offered better performance as opposed to other formats that we had considered before. And um, what happened was because of this change in this uh, log format, uh, 
there was log loss because there were portions of our pipeline that did not recognize formats and we ended up with log losses. And like I said, this was a big no-no. And how did we solve it? Well, luckily, even though container logs were in text format, they, there is a predefined specification for the format, which is a timestamp, the stream, tag, and the actual log message. And they were all space delimited. And we could pretty much use Fluentd configuration to actually parse it out using a regex. So that's precisely what we did. Uh, what we did was we changed our bootstrap code to make sure that each node came up with the CRI runtime that was, that was running that node. And our Fluentd bootstrap container would read that file and load up the right Fluentd config map. For Docker, it remained the same JSON based configurations, but for container D, it was a regex parser that would extract out the log message and eventually send it out to Splunk. The one thing to note that is with this approach, we did observe a 17% dip in performance of log throughput that was sent out. And this was because of the additional regex overhead that we were seeing uh, with Fluentd. What was the second problem? Well, the way our cluster upgrades work is that the nodes are rotated out first, and then the add-ons are upgraded. And what was happening was there was a period of time when the nodes were rotated out and the new CRI was coming in place, but Fluentd still did not recognize that they need, it needed to do the bootstrapping changes we had made. As a result, there was again log loss during that period of time when the clusters were getting upgraded. So how did we solve it? It was pretty simple. We just got our code for the platform, uh, the release before the actual migration to container D. So that, that, that was one big takeaway for us is you have to actually not just make all the wiring changes, you have to actually get it in a release, one release at least, N minus one release before your actual CRI migration. The second gotcha I'm gonna talk about today is regarding CNI. Again, a quick refresher. Uh, the CNI that we were using uh, along with pod and uh, host networking stack wiring for, um, uh, for container networking also took care of IPAM daemon. So basically, the IPAM daemon was like this lo lo local host daemon uh, that was responsible for two things. One, maintaining a warm pool of IP addresses uh, to hand out to uh, pods, and also taking care of allocating and deallocating IP addresses for the pods. And for IP allocation and deallocation, it would query the CRI socket to get a list of running pods. And a CNI was running as a daemon set in all our cluster nodes. So what was the problem? Well, to prepare our CNI for our CR, uh, container D migration, we had actually mounted container D socket uh, in the CNI pod spec as expected from our CNI vendor. And a CNI is actually a bootstrap add-on for us. So in this case, the bootstrap add-ons get rotate, like upgraded before the nodes get rotated out. So you can see the problem, right? This meant that like a, a node would, a Docker node would still be running, but the uh, CNI would think that this was container D um, node, and it would query the container D socket, get an empty list of pods, and voila, it would be like, oh, okay, this node doesn't need any more IP, so let me start deallocating from uh, the, pod, the Docker pods, which were actually live and running. So this was, again, a big no-no for us. So how did we solve it? Well, we created a generic symlink for whether it's a C, uh, container D socket or a Docker socket in our bootstrap code. So if a node came up with Docker daemon, then uh, this generic CRI.soc would actually point to that. If it came up with uh, container D, then it would point to container D.soc. And uh, the CRI soc was actually mounted into our pods, uh, CNI, CNI pod spec, uh, 
And we made sure that, again, that these changes got into a release prior to the actual migration because you had to prepare your CNI code to handle this before the actual migration. All right, let's talk about performance. We had already set expectations that pod startup times and CPU memory consumption for pods would be lesser in ContainerD, but we wanted to actually verify that and see how much of a performance gain we get. So um, our setup was running Docker 19.3 and ContainerD 146 on Kubernetes 121. And the test service is a Java Spring Boot application that very closely mimics our uh, developer environments. And our test line generates about 6,000 transactions per second. And these transactions are mostly a combination of uh, reads and writes into a memory heavy, um, like memory heavy uh, load, a GraphQL in memory database calls. And um, the test was set up to actually ramp up for the first 60 minutes and then have a steady load of about um, 6,000 transactions per second for, the, for two hours. And we started with an HPA uh, replica of count three. How did we do in this? Well, uh, Containerd definitely fared well. Uh, especially in the startup times, we noticed that Containerd startup time maximum uh, latency was only about 120 seconds in our synthetic workload, as opposed to Docker, uh, which, which took about 200 seconds. And we're pretty excited about this performance gain because uh, it will come in handy during our tax peak seasons when there is very uh, high, HPA kicks in and we have a lot of replicas running at the same time and startup times really matter. And uh, during the steady state of about 120 minutes, we noticed that because of a lower, slightly lower CPU consumption, there was lesser number of pod and node usage because H, like, it was just a slightly more efficient, and HPA doesn't kick in for a slightly longer than when compared to Docker. So I'm going to wrap it up with some takeaways. Understand your uh, cluster CRI wiring. This was our use case where we thought we could just start off with a simple migration from Docker to ContainerD. It turned out to be a several month project for us. So understand your CRI wiring and plan to test and verify ahead of time because Kubernetes 124 is coming up and there will not be a Docker shim anymore. And the third big takeaway for us is you have to account for live cluster migration if you have a big, big platform like us. For us, with the 220 plus clusters, we had, and with zero downtime, you had to, we had to make sure that uh, all the live migration use cases were handled. Thank you very much. And we are hiring at Intuit, so if you're interested, please come and talk to me, and I can take some questions now. Hello. Uh, you mentioned that your CNI needs access to the Docker socket, right? Yes. And do, do you know if the Docker socket, if the container this socket is compatible, like fully compatible, or you needed to change your CNI codes to read it in a different format? Uh, so the CNI socket, the CNI basically queries the CRI socket mainly to get a list of uh, containers and pods so that it can actually do IP allocation. So as far as uh, compatibility goes, it's a, it's, the interface is pretty well established and to what it is expected. So we didn't see any compatibility issues there. It was more around the live migration where our CNI did not account for both set of uh, C uh, CRIs to be available at a particular point in a cluster upgrade situation. 
Just a question about the GPU you say in the description you hit some issue uh, with GPU. Can you say more about that, please? So the GPU issue was about, so it's more about a vendor issue more than a container issue. So um, we get our GPU support from NVIDIA and our cloud provider is AWS. And uh, the issue there was the NVIDIA GPU operator out there for container D doesn't work out of the box for AWS. Um, it's mainly around uh, OS support. So we had to work closely with AWS to actually get a separate recipe and uh, bake it into our AMIs. And the other uh, sort of glitch in there was the uh, end user license agreement between NVIDIA and AWS had to be sorted out. So, um, so far, uh, we've done some preliminary testing with GPU. There have been no issues with Containerd, although we haven't gone fully production with it. But I think if you have NVIDIA uh, GPU operator running on CentOS uh, and or Ubuntu, then you have out of the box support. All right, thank you everyone.